Hello, good evening, and welcome to the Museum of Science. Thank you for coming out and joining us for this very special night, delving into the realm of charisma. Um, take a moment right now, if you don't mind, and do the usual courtesy, turn off your cell phones and pagers. And if you need to leave before the um, program is over, kindly exit up the stairs at the rear of the theater, out that door, because it minimizes interruptions. And I also want to extend a very sincere thanks to the Lowell Institute and to Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare for co-sponsoring our Connected series. Um, without your support, this wonderful series of programs would not be possible, and we thank you very, very deeply. The English term charisma, from the Greek word charisma, means favor freely given. It derives from the word charis, which means grace, and many ancient texts, like the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible, refer to hero figures as having charismatic traits that were divinely bestowed, the gift of God's grace. Today, we still perceive charisma as exceptional, an almost superhuman X factor that only the lucky are born with. But what if we're wrong? What if charisma can be learned? Wouldn't you want to cultivate some for yourself? Hell yeah. <laughs> well, our two special guests are going to lift the mysterious veil and usher us into the science of charisma. MIT professor Alex Sandy Pentland is a pioneer in organizational engineering, mobile information systems, and computational social science. His research focuses on harnessing information flows within social networks, developing human-centered technology, and converting it all into real-world ventures. His work provides people with a clearer picture of their social environment and helps companies and communities reinvent themselves to be both more human and more productive. Founder and director of MIT's Human Dynamics Group, and the Media Lab Entrepreneurship Program, Dr. Pentland is among the most cited computer scientists in the world. In 1997, Newsweek named him one of the 100 Americans likely to shape this century. And in 2011, he was chosen by Forbes magazine as one of the world's top data scientists. His book, Honest Signals, was published in 2008 and his Honest Signals research was selected as Breakthrough Idea of the Year by Harvard Business Review. Olivia Fox Cabain studied international business for many years and then had a revelation. The science of social skills could be extraordinarily effective in the business world. Influenced by her father, a research scientist, and her mother, a psychologist, she veered into behavioral science and began her career by giving free presentations to students at MIT. Now, she has her own company, Spitfire Communications, and is renowned for her expertise in charisma, leadership, influence, and persuasion. She is a frequent keynote speaker and executive coach to the leaders of Fortune 500 companies. Her best-selling book, The Charisma Myth, was published earlier this year and revealed that anyone, that means any of us here tonight, can indeed cultivate charisma. We're extremely fortunate to have both of these luminaries in our company tonight. We'll hear first from Dr. Pentland, then from Ms. Fox Cobain, and there will be plenty of time for questions from the audience. So please join me in welcoming to the Museum of Science, Dr. Sandy Pentland. So happy to be here today. Uh, thank you all for coming and hope we can get some things going that are gonna benefit you. So what I wanna talk about today to begin with is sort of the biological roots of charisma and the way we communicate with each other. Um, and to do that, I'm going to start with an interesting diagram. Um, this is something that uh, was in the Nobel Prize lecture of Danny Kahneman. And Danny Kahneman is the guy that developed behavioral economics. You may have heard of the book Nudge. 
how people are not entirely rational and you can bias them one way or the other. And he makes the point that people have two ways of thinking. One is the one we concentrate on almost all the time. I labeled it attentive here. It's reasoning things out. It's slow. It's rule-based. It's, it's things like that. And then the other is habitual. And it's very fast. You can trade lots of things off. And the habitual one is by far the oldest. It is something we share with virtually every vertebrate animal on the globe. It's hundreds of millions of years old. And the natural thing for people is to assume that this attentive stuff is the best stuff. That's what makes us human, right? That's why we go to school. But in fact, we're not actually very good at it. <laughs> okay? uh, a friend of mine at Berkeley did a study where he snuck around after the world's most famous uh, uh, experts and listened to predictions they made in their field of expertise. And he did this for 20 years. And then he followed up later to see if they were right. You want to guess how accurate the world's <laughs> smartest people are in their domain of expertise? Like 50%. No, around 50%. <laughs> yeah, not so good. Um, the other thing is that we are good with it. When there's only a few variables, it's not so complicated. And that gives us the illusion that we really know how to do this. But for complicated things, your habitual, your intuition, is actually much better at the trade-offs. And that actually is a good thing, because probably 95 to 98 percent of what you do every day is not the attentive thinking through stuff, it's the habitual stuff. It's easy to see why. This is the stuff, but you know, you have to make the decision right now. It's complicated. You go with your gut. And as long as you have a lot of experience, it actually works really well. If you don't have experience, you'll like drive off the cliff and bad things will happen. So this, attentive, this habitual thing that we use almost all the time actually developed before we had language. And the question then is, is, well, we were a social species before we had language. We had this way of thinking. How did we communicate? And the answer, if you think about it, is pretty obvious, but people don't talk about it that much. We had signals that we gave to each other, signals of attraction, signals of dominance, <coughs> signals of interest signals of charisma. It's something that we evolved to be able to communicate before we had language. And as we developed language, we didn't get rid of it. We just put language on top of it. So when you listen to somebody, there's words, but you can also listen to another thing that's happening, and that's the signaling. And the signaling conveys social relationships. It's my attitude towards you. It's what I think about this. I'm interested. I I want to be the dominant one, I'm attracted, whatever those signals are. And they come across in body language and in tone of voice. And you see a lot of literature that says, well, you know, if the person blinks their eye and goes like this at the same time, that means they're lying. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> the signals that we have are things we share with apes and, in fact, most other animals. Like, I'll give you an example. How many of you have dogs? Can you tell when your dog is excited? Of course you can, right? They bark and the tail, you know? And that's the signal we have. We can read mental state of other animals that aren't so closely related to us. Or think about a three-year-old. What does a three-year-old do when they're excited? They bounce up and down and they can't shut up, right? <laughs> just, just like the dog and just like us. In fact, we did an experiment with people who were professional poker players. There's a little twist on it. This being excited and being sort of nervous energy is called a tell in poker. It's how you can tell that somebody's got a good hand. And so they train for years to suppress it. And guess what you can do if you're using a computer to measure it? You can tell when they're bluffing or when they've got a good hand because they act more suppressed, more dead than they do normally. So when they freeze up, you know they've got a good hand. <laughs> we, we, we are not very good at hiding this stuff. The sort of stuff that these signals do is they're really very deep in us. They're brain signals. So there's an interesting experiment that I like where people took two people, they put them in brain scanners, and they had them talk to each other. And what was interesting is the brain of the person being talked to lit up before the other person really began speaking. 
They were anticipating each other. It's like a dance between the two people where you know what's coming next. You light up in the right way, whether you're you know, evolved and excited or not. The sorts of things that we have as signals are illustrated here. The most basic one is this notion of interest and activity. It's the three-year-old bouncing around. You can tell when somebody's interested. Another one is we call influence. It has to do with attention. So if you're not paying attention, there are these sort of awkward gaps between things. It takes a little time for it to get through your brain and out to your eyeballs or your hands or whatever. If you're paying attention, it's like that dance that I saw in the, in the brain scan where I anticipate people. So when people converse, they trade turns at an astounding accuracy. It's like a millisecond between when you stop and I begin, because I know, without thinking about it, when you're going to stop and I jump in just perfectly. And so that timing tells you when two people are really involved. It also tells you who's dominant, because the dominant person tends to cut off the other person. They drive the conversation, literally. And you can use that in things like presidential debates if you watch it, OK? <laughs> um, two other things that are worth paying attention to. Mimicry, this is something that's mostly special to people. Apes have a little bit of it, too. If you ever sit down with somebody and start talking to them, and they start nodding their head, right? And then you'll start nodding your head. You, you almost cannot not do it. it. It's just wired into us. We actually have specialized brain structures for this. And what that person is telling you when they're nodding along with you is not that they agree, but that they understand. They empathize. Perhaps they trust you. They're much more likely to trust you. So it's a signal of being on the same page. You can imagine why evolution would develop these sort of things. Imagine you're going off to hunt the bastodons, right? You want to know that the guys that are at your back are excited, right? You want to know that they're on the same page, right? <laughs> you know? Another thing you want to know is that they know what they're doing, and that's this fourth signal, which is consistency. When people have practiced things a lot, they can be very fluid in how they do it. Think of a ballerina that's practiced for thousands of hours, and you can just see the difference. It's somehow much more fluid and, and, and smooth than if you or I did it, especially if I did it. Right? And so you, it's a mark of expertise that's very hard to fake. And so that's the guy you wanted your back to, the guy who's just ace with that bow or the spear or whatever when we go out to hunt. And what these signals do is they come together to communicate your attitudes about things, about the relationship, about the circumstance. And what I've done in my lab is develop these little badges that have a lot of electronics in them. And what they do is they measure those signals. So if we were all wearing these and we were talking, it would be measuring your interest level, your uh, empathy, your expertise, who was dominant as we did it. It's just a computer in there measuring the tone of your voice, the, the, the little features of your voice. And what it actually looks at, this is a spectrogram showing um, the, the frequency is the vertical and horizontal is the time, breaking out the little pieces of speech and measuring how long they are. And then you compare that to the other person's speech, and you look at how they fit together, who's driving the conversation, how excited are they, and so forth. And that's the electronics in here. And what we've done in my lab is we've taken this, and we've gone out into the field and done dozens and dozens and dozens of experiments with hundreds and hundreds of people. And we find things that are, you, you all sort of know all this stuff, but you always get poo-pooed because there's no data about it? Well, now there's data. Like, for instance, we looked at people negotiating a pay raise. OK? Now, this is fake in the sense that it was uh, business school students. They all had to negotiate exactly the same circumstance. But they actually got paid depending on what they negotiated. And their grade depended on it. So they were, like, into it. And we could listen to how they talked to each other for the first couple minutes and predict what they would negotiate to within $1,000 because they either sounded empathetic and determined, if they're the subordinate one, the one that's asking for the raise. So they sounded like, I'm here to help you, but I really have to have this. Or if they were the boss, they were 
yes, I understand, but we really have to do this. So they're very, you know, firm in it. They're very, the, the, the rhythm is very, very uh, regular. And so you can actually tell from the social signals, not from the content, how things come out. We went to a bar. They're doing speed dating. That's where, you know, men and women sit down. They talk for three minutes. They write down secretly whether or not they'll exchange contact information, and then they go on to the next one. And, and so we put badges on people, and we listened to them as they did. Now, we don't know anything about the people or what they said, but we could predict with about five times chance, about 75% accuracy, uh, who was going to exchange uh, data and who was not going to exchange contact information, just from how they spoke to each other. And an interesting little detail there is that everyone thinks that the men will always write down, yes, exchange information. But actually, the men were very accurate at nailing when the woman was going to do it. And it's only then that they wrote down. So somehow, they were able to read the woman as well as this little box. And only then did they write down, yes, exchange information. The final one up here that I think is interesting is pitching your vision. We looked at mid-career people pitching real business plans. So these are people that are going to start a business, and they're pitching it, and other mid-career people are grading it. And what we found is you could predict the rating of the business plan without listening to the business plan. And you could do it almost as well as a human could. And if you think about it, that's really, it sounds weird, but think about it. Here's this person telling you something. You don't know anything about it. So what, how are you going to judge the words, right? How are you going to judge this plan? Well, you sort of seem to say to yourself, well, they seem excited, and they seem expert about it. In other words, their presentation is very fluid and practiced. They put a lot of effort into this, and they seem energetic. They're very active and, you know, emphasizing things. So they seem to believe in it, and gosh, if they're expert and they believe in it, it must be pretty good. And those are the two factors that predict the rating of the business plan. Now, if you read it later without the person speaking it, you get a very different answer. Just something to remember, OK? And what we've been able to do with this is translate this into things that are able to listen to people out in the go around daily life, pick out people who are leaders, people who are dominant in situations, people who can influence others. We've also been able to pick out connectors. That's really interesting. It turns out the people that are connectors in an organization have a very peculiar way of talking. What they do is they tend to be dominant, so they ask a lot of questions. They set the rhythm of the conversation, but they're asking questions. They're not telling people. So they sound open and inviting, a lot of variation in prosody, but they're influencing the pattern of the conversation because they're seeking out information to connect people. And so we can do an incredibly good job of picking out connectors just by listening to how they talk to other people. So the final thing I'm going to say, and then I'll sit down, is we've been able to turn this into things that uh, have some social good. So we founded a company that listens to people in healthcare. So for people that have chronic disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, whatever, they often have a nurse call up, and the nurse talks to them for a while and tries to help them with their disease. But there's a couple things that happen that go wrong, and nurses aren't so good at this. One is, is that you know, if the nurse says, well, you should sign up for this health club, what does everybody say? Sure. Everybody says, sure. <laughs> Let me off. <laughs> I hang up, right? You know? Everybody says, sure. But only a s relatively small fraction actually do it. But you can listen to it. In fact, actually, the computer can listen to it and tell who's blowing the nurse off and who's actually going to sign up. <laughs> That's pretty good. So you can hear when someone's actually engaged in the conversation and going to do it. The other thing we've been able to do is tell when somebody's depressed. Now, that's really important because if people are depressed, they tend not to take care of themselves. So if you can sort of say, hey, this person sounds depressed, it turns out the nurses are so focused on their words that they can't hear the signaling. And so what the computer does is it says, hey, listen to the signaling. This sounds like somebody who's depressed. You should ask some questions about this. And so those are things that are now in commercial operation uh, to try and make caregivers a little more empathetic and actually a little bit more charismatic in terms of being able to convince people to do the sorts of things that they ought to do. 
So with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to somebody who's really charismatic. <laughs> I think you're going to enjoy the next speaker, Olivia, here. <clears throat> So I'm rarely nervous before speaking on stage. I'm one of those weird people who actually enjoys public speaking. But when I heard that I was going to be speaking with Sandy Pentland, I pretty much jumped up and down and said, that's my kind of rock star. <laughs> so I hope I won't trip over too many words tonight. But um, I will give you what little I know about charisma. Quick question for you. How many of you in here have learned how to drive a car? All right, anyone who has raised their hands can learn charisma. Because what it turns out is that charisma is actually a learned behavior. The reason that we think charisma is innate is that like many other social skills, it's usually learned early in life when people aren't even consciously aware that they're learning it. They're just trying new behaviors, seeing the results, and refining their behaviors, and eventually, the behaviors become instinctive. Some people, however, decide later on that they're going to learn this whole charisma thing. Steve Jobs is a great example. And you can see if you track his videos from 84 to his most recent ones, how he gradually acquired step by step each of the charismatic behaviors we're going to cover tonight. So what are these behaviors? They, t they fall into three categories. Presence, power, and warmth. And what's really interesting is that when we, um, when we look at fMRI studies, what people measure in each other in the first instance of meeting each other is warmth and competence, which essentially is associated to warmth and power. These are the dimensions that we care about most. Throughout the conversation, presence is one of the key things. When, when you hear people describe their experience of seeing charisma in action, whether they met Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, or the Dalai Lama, they often mention what an extraordinary presence the person has. Presence is the single most requested area of charisma when I coach executives. And they're right to focus on it because presence turned out to be the core component of charisma, the foundation upon which all else is built. When you're with a charismatic master, if you take Bill Clinton, for example, he gives you the feeling that he's completely here with you in the moment. And I've met hardened Republicans who've told me, Bill Clinton, I hated him before I met him. I hated him after I met him. But while I met him, man, I love the man. <laughs> so how do you get presence? Well, let's first look at the cost of not being present. Have you ever felt? in the middle of a conversation, as if only half your mind were present, while the other half was busy thinking about something else. Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you. <laughs> right. Do you think the other person noticed? When you're not fully present in an interaction, there's a good chance that your eyes will glaze over and that your facial reactions will be a split second delayed. Because human beings can read one another's face as fast as 17 to milliseconds, the person you're speaking to will likely notice even the tiniest delay in your reactions. And this, on, on a gut level, this will give them the feeling that there's something not quite right, something that doesn't quite fit. The delay, which is technically called an incongruence, can even give them the feeling that you're being inauthentic. Nothing kills trust or charisma faster than being inauthentic. So with that said, how do you get present and how do you stay present in a conversation? One of my favorite techniques is kind of quirky, but it really works. Right now, focus on the sensations in your toes. The physical sensations, big toes, little toes, all the ones in between, however many you have. Focus on the physical sensations in your toes. What this does is that it forces your mind to sweep um, your body from head to, of course, toe, and gets you very physically present in the moment. The other technique you can do when you're in a conversation um, is to really focus on the colors of the eyes of the person you're speaking to. 
Most human eyes have a dazzling array of colors, if you really pay attention, which can keep you quite captivated, and better yet, give you the kind of deep, soul-searching eye contact <laughs> that is very powerful, the kind that Clinton is famous for. So obviously, don't overdo it, <laughs> but it's extremely effective. Giving people the feeling that they are the center of the universe is one of the most effective ways of being charismatic, this full presence, this full attention. Because guess what? Charisma is not just how you make people feel about you. It's also how you make them feel about themselves. In the heated London election of 1886, William Gladstone was run against Benjamin Disraeli for the post of prime minister to the British Empire. And in the very last week before the election, both men happened to take the same young lady out to dinner. So naturally, the press asked her what impressions the rivals had made. She said, after dining with Mr. Gladstone, I thought he was the cleverest man in England. After dining with Mr. Disraeli, I thought I was the cleverest woman in England. <laughs> Guess who won the election? The Israeli, of course, the man who made others feel intelligent and fascinating. So that is what a charismatic presence can achieve. Presence, again, is one of the core components of charisma, the foundation upon which all else is built. Together with presence, power and warmth combine to form charismatic magnetism. So let's look at power. Power is not actually commanding an army. It's not the actual power you wield, but our perception of your ability to affect the world around you, whether this be through raw physical power or large amounts of money, influence, expertise, intelligence, high social status, and so forth. We look for clues of power in people's appearance, in others' reaction to this person, but most of all, in that person's body language. And as Sandy was telling you, I'm sure you've heard of the importance of, of body language, but you have to realize that the fact that his lab was able to measure the success of business plans, sales calls, negotiations without listening to a single word of content, only by analyzing the voice fluctuation body language is, just tells you just how critical body language is. And, well, let me show you this. What's a powerful body language? Imagine an alpha um, gorilla charging through the, the jungle. What does he do? If a rival has just breached his territory and our alpha wants to intimidate the rival off his territory, what does the alpha gorilla do? He pounds his chest, yeah, why? What does it do if he pounds his chest? It makes noise, okay, what else does it do? Look from here to here. He's bigger, yeah. Turns out alpha humans do exactly the same thing. They sit on one chair, they'll drape their arm on a second, they'll put their feet up on a third or even on the desk. <laughs> These gestures are all ways of claiming space. And what the Stanford researchers found is that when people assume these kind of expansive poses, so actually, if right now, show me, imagine, um, if you imagine a nervous, insecure person, they're probably claiming a smaller amount of space than you, if you picture Colin Powell, right? So if you could stand up right now and show me how would you stand if you were a military general? Imagine you're a five-star general <laughs> reviewing your troops, little troops of GI Joes parading the room in front of you. How do you stand? All right, so broad stance, right? What else? Chest out, what do you do with your hands? You're gonna be there for a couple of hours, you better get comfortable. <laughs> what do you do with your hands? Yeah. Why do you put your hands behind your back? It makes you bigger, right? So here's the thing, stay there for a second. Again, what the Stanford researchers found is that when people assume these kind of expansive poses, they experience a measurable physiological shift. And in one experience, anxiety hormones fell by 25%, while assertiveness and energy-boosting hormones rose by 19%.
So when you assume a physically strong, powerful posture, you actually get to feel more powerful. When you feel more powerful, your body language adapts accordingly, which gives you yet another biochemical boost, and the cycle builds upon itself. All you have to do is get it going. Thank you. In a way, just like an athlete preparing to perform, what you're learning to do is play chemist with your own brain. And a lot of what the best charisma tools are about are exactly that, learning how to play chemist with your own brain, learning how to get yourself into exactly the kind of mental state you need to for peak performance. So that's a good transition from the, um, to the mental side of power. So on the mental side, what hinders our power? The single biggest obstacle is not lack of bank account funds, it's not lack of status symbols, and it's not lack of influence. It's lack of self-confidence. In one of the manifestations of self-confidence known as the imposter syndrome, people feel that they don't really know what they're doing, and it's just a matter of time before they're found out and exposed as a fraud. This syndrome affects 70 to 80% of the population, estimated the original researchers who looked at this. Um, what's for sure is that it hits the highest levels of business and education. I know that every time I speak at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, MIT, you can hear the room go so silent you could hear a pin drop. And then the students breathe a sigh of relief at hearing that this has a name and they weren't the only ones that felt it. I've heard that every time the incoming class at Stanford Business School is asked, how many of you in here feel that you are the one mistake the admissions committee made? Every time, two-thirds of the class immediately raise their hand. So dismantling the imposter syndrome is possible. We can't get into that today, but the short answer is that it absolutely is possible. You learn to destigmatize the imposter syndrome, uh, dismantle it, take it apart. Um, one of the, the critical tools for that is actually one that I think we'll have time to, to look at under the warmth section, because remember, charisma is Presence, power, and thank you. Warmth is pretty simple. It's how much someone gives us the impression that they like us. Warmth is perceived almost entirely through body language and behavior. It's, it's um, evaluated even more directly than power. The important thing to know about warmth is that you cannot fake it. Because because warmth is so closely tied to body language, and because there's so much body language flowing out of us every minute, we can't possibly consciously control all of it. How many of you in here were aware of your eyelids fluttering in front of your eyes right now? How about the weight of your tongue in your mouth? How about the position of your toes? Have you forgotten your eyelids again? <laughs> Think about it. There's so many signals pouring out from us every minute. We can't possibly control all of them consciously. And it turns out that even we control the main expression on our face. If what we're feeling inside is different, sooner or later what's called a micro expression will flash and people will catch that. This would cause an incongruence, which you now know can give them the feeling that you're being inauthentic, not a good thing. This is why great actors were often exhausted after performances because they had been working so hard to keep their entire flow of body language into congruence. And even if, with years of training, it was impossible to be absolutely perfect. So what did Hollywood do? What new form of training did they come up with? Headshots, Headshots all right. <laughs> What new form of acting did they come up with? Yeah. Method acting. What's method acting? Not being the you become the character. So you don't try to control the output, which is the body language. You go straight to the source, which is essentially your mind. Why does this work? Close your eyes. Imagine a lemon. Cut the lemon in half. Suck in the lemon juice. Now imagine dragging your fingernails across a chalkboard. <laughs> Open your eyes. There was no lemon. There was no chalkboard. 
and yet many of you had very real physical reactions to a completely imaginary event. In Hollywood, this is called method acting. In medicine, they call it the placebo effect. Your mind has a really hard time distinguishing imagination from reality. In sports, they use this technique under the form of visualization. And 86% of American Olympic athletes at one point used this tool. Jack Nicklaus, golfer, um, said that he would never hit a shot even in practice without visualizing it first. So we're going to try it right now. Could you please find someone in the room that you do not like? <laughs> I'm kidding. Turn towards a neighbor. Just find a neighbor, turn towards them. Try to stay silent. I know it's hard, but just find a neighbor, turn towards them. Look at them, not me. All right. Look closely at each other's eyes, really closely. Could we bring up the lights a bit more? They're going to need to see each other. So look closely at each other's eyes. When you have a good look, close your eyes. I want you to think of a problem at work, something annoying, something frustrating, something that is causing you losses of time and money. Try to get into it, because the more you can get into it, the more you'll see an effect. So keep your eyes closed and just think of a problem at work. Something annoying, something that's causing embarrassment or frustration, something the outcome of which is uncertain. Get into it and open your eyes and look at each other. <laughs> All right, close your eyes again. Close your eyes again. Think of someone for whom you have great affection. This could be a person. This could be a pet. It could even be a stuffed animal. Just feel the warm affection you have for this being. Think of how much you like them. Let yourself flow in the warmth. Feel that affection you have for them from your tippy toes to the top of your head. Get into the warmth and affection as much as you can. Open your eyes and look at each other. <laughs> so you saw a difference in their face, right? Where did you see the biggest difference? Where in their face did you see the biggest difference? In their eyes. What are the eyes? How many of you are thinking the windows to the soul? It's cute, and it's also true. The area around the eyes is one of the most mobile of the entire human face, and therefore the most expressive, which is why poker players wear sunglasses, and why shipping magnate Onassis also used to wear sunglasses so that his opponents could not know what he was thinking. So this is a quick tool for you, just for you to realize that any time you want to have genuine warmth and affection, all you need to do is play chemist with your own brain, Get the right cocktails flowing through your body, and you'll be in full warm state. So just to close this off, now you know that charisma is presence, power, and warmth. How do you get presence? Focus on your toes, yeah. <laughs> um, how do you get power? Take a good aim, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and warmth? Just play chemist with your own brain for all of these, actually. With that, thank you very much, and I think we're going to go into Q&A. So, so we need some cues. <laughs> Sir, I can see you. Is your uh, car being used for a uh, lie detector or any type of uh, being able to determine if someone's telling the truth? Well, lie detectors, including the sort of card that I have, are really measuring stress or these, uh, these sort of inappropriate things that people do. Um, but of course, somebody who really believes what they're saying, or somebody who just doesn't give a darn, will just go right through it. And that's why they don't work very well. But, but there actually is something that's interesting. So, so 
lie detectors don't work because there are people who are professional liars. They're really good at it. But think about another thing. If you have ever been in a situation where you're closing a business deal or there's some big thing happening, what people always do in every culture in the world is they have dinner together or lunch together beforehand. Why do they do that? It's not just because food's good. It's because now you've got this person in this natural, interactive situation, and you can see what they really think about you. You know, do they, are, they folk, are they showing these properties of you know, being there? Are they powerful? Are they empathetic for you? Do they actually like you? And you get a real feel from a person in these natural situations, but you can't do it very well in an artificial, limited situation. And I think that's why we have these traditions uh, of, of doing social things before we do business things. So, I'm sorry, we're, yeah. the way we do our Q&A is we go pick the people just okay. because otherwise, <laughs> otherwise that we can't get their audio on the video. But I wanted to first ask you all a question, which was, so if you become very good at these, at consciously these three things, the warmth, the power, and the presence, how can you detect inauthenticity in someone who has perfected it? Perhaps, you know, that might be a politician, that might be, um, you know, a CEO, a president of a museum, who knows? But um, <laughs> I was just curious, like how, that, that is not a reflection on our president, but I was just, I mean, is that, does that end up becoming an issue that people become so practiced at it that it's not real? Well, I remember I had, I actually had lunch with Bill Cohen and, and it was remarkable in his sort of presence and warmth to everybody. But after a little while, it was clear that this was something that was abnormal. Now, maybe he was blessed with infinite amounts of warmth. But you can't be that warm to everybody, not all the time. And, and, and so you get this feeling like there's a space alien that you're sitting next to, <laughs> right? Or, or I remember, um, I don't know if you know who Jeffrey Sachs is. He's the advisor to the, the you know, head. I remember him coming in and giving a talk, and everybody in the, in the audience, he's incredibly charismatic. Everybody goes, oh my God, this is the truth. This is how we're going to save humanity. And everyone's walking out. And then the next day, we get together and say, wait a second, that was really stupid. <laughs> Why did I believe that? It's like, you know, so, so the context uh, in both of those cases told you that, you know, aliens have landed in my brain, and <laughs> I better watch out. So, so does that happen with, like, um, political candidates or leaders of countries or I'm sure it does. Companies? I think all, from my perspective, all you can tell is whether or not the person really believes what he or she is saying. If they are in a state where they are completely convinced, utterly excited, and completely confident about what they're saying, it will come across as authentic. The one thing I, I think is true, and I don't know, maybe you, know, you disagree, is um, I don't like debates because you know, these people are saying what the committee told them to say, right? And they've done it so often that they're, it's hard to tell authenticity, I think. But there are some things when, when they talk about certain subjects, um, they're either a little more excited or a little less excited, or their body language is a little dismissive. It doesn't have that mm -hmm. warmth. And so don't listen to the words. Don't listen to what you know, they're, they're, they're trying to tell you. But you can sort of say their attitude about the subject. Is this really something that's important to them and they're engaged about it? Uh, or is this just one of those things you have to do because you're running for office? First of all, it's an honor to hear both of you speak tonight. Um, my question is, and neither of you mentioned it, but how much does one's physical attractiveness and yeah. good looks have an effect on other people's perception of your char charismatic characteristics, I guess? That one I actually have an answer for. <laughs> um, turns out surprisingly little. Uh, yes, physical attractiveness in the first 
one or two seconds does play a part, but after that, it diminishes quite quickly. And it turns out that becoming, being charismatic um, actually enhances people's perception of your attractiveness. There's a couple of enterprising researchers did performed uh, con experiments, and in control laboratory experiments, they were able to raise or lower participants' level of charisma as if they were turning a dial just by instructing them to display specific charismatic behaviors. Question here. Hi. Um, Linda Babcock from the University of um, Pennsylvania, uh, or Pittsburgh, I'm not sure which. She talked about negotiation and the fact that women don't negotiate as well as men. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to <coughs> both women's skills at what you're both talking about, but also perception of them and, and how to positively switch that. Well, uh, big subject. I can tell you what we've <laughs> seen and, and done. Um, so in the negotiations we've looked at, uh, this sense of being powerful or dominance is really important. Um, and it's a, it's a little more confrontational than I suspect most women feel comfortable with. At least in the data that we have, women weren't as much that way. On the other hand, that may not actually be true, what, what you just said, because most negotiations are repeated negotiations. And in repeated negotiations, you have to leave the negotiation with the other person having trust and respect for you, right? Because you're going to come back and negotiate with them again. And if you break it into a really confrontational thing, you're not going to get to the best possible solution. And I suspect that women appreciate that repeated property more than men do. But that's speculation. <laughs> I have the next question over here. Hi, thank you for uh, speaking here. Um, my question goes along the lines of, you guys talked a lot about what to do to become more charismatic. How do you kind of let us know how to become more charismatic? So kind of the how of it. So little examples like you were talking about standing up straight with your chest up in the air. What other types of examples like that could you offer to, to us? There's kind of a book written about that. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up a year of my life to write this thing. <laughs> All right, let me pull out a few more. Um, pay attention to the amount of how you're breathing. So one of, the, um, one of the first things that I ask clients when they come see me is how you're breathing right now. If you're taking short, shallow chest breaths, what you're doing is there, there is a chance that you're activating your sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight or flight syndrome, which you do not want to do. That, tells your limbic brain that you're fleeing away from a saber-toothed tiger, not a good idea for being charismatic, because then being charismatic is really not a priority. So learning to how to take full belly breaths is surprisingly one important thing. Um, here's another one. In the imposter syndrome, inner critic, et cetera, category. So have you ever been in a conversation when you say something and all of a sudden, Immediately afterwards, you think, ooh, that was stupid, <laughs> right? What happens to your face in that moment? You cringe, right? You wince, tension, judgment, etc. Now, this is self-criticism, self-judgment, self, all that, right? But they don't know that. <laughs> all they know is that while they, you were listening to them, looking at them, and presumably thinking about them, they accurately read tension, criticism, and coldness on your face. So what are they naturally going to assume? <coughs> that it's about them. Think about that the next time you're in a conversation with someone and you see tension or reserve or criticism on their face. There's actually a fair chance it could be entirely about them. So don't assume that your immediate assumption is valid. And once you understand that your immediate assumption isn't valid, create a more charisma-enhancing one. The rest is in the book. <laughs> I, I have one thing to add to that, which is um, it's difficult to pay attention to these things while you're actually doing something, like negotiating. And something you said is I, I find a really good thing, which is method acting. You have to believe you're the person you want to be. You have to psych yourself up so that you're, you're in that person's 
mind and that person's shoes. And if you are that way, if you're really, in some sense, putting on their social role, a lot of this stuff begins to happen naturally. And it's at a very deep level. Like for instance, there was a study of doctors who were taught um, method acting to get better bedside manner. So it's a complete fake, right? You know, just act like you're good, right? Act like you care. But then when they went back and looked at it, they actually changed the way they practiced medicine because, because through method acting, through really putting on this role, they actually became more empathetic. It wasn't what they wanted to do. It just, they brainwashed themselves <laughs> by, by putting on that role. And so to me, that's, that's a way to approach it that isn't, um, is, is in some sense a central thing that you need to do. Next question in the middle here. Hey guys, thanks for coming out. Uh, Sandy, you had uh, mentioned a point earlier about ballerinas and how it takes them quite a long time to perfect their movements. And then Olivia, you gave us a lot of examples of what we can do uh, to become more, charis more charismatic. Let's tie the two together and my question is, how long does it take for someone who leaves here, or read your book, <laughs> to go from being maybe not so charismatic to being much more charismatic? <laughs> well, the canonical answer is 10,000 hours. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. What do you think? Um, I'd say as fast as it takes method acting to work. I find one thing is, is once, once you become aware of these cues and sort of uh, see other people use them and observe yourself doing it, you've gone a long way already because now you, it, it's conscious, you can assess it, you can become the person you want to become, you can see when you did it right. You say, oh, hey, that went pretty well. I acted the way I wanted to act and you know, it came off okay. And, and it doesn't take too much of that for you to begin to learn what's happening. To be Bill Clinton, it's gonna take you a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, one more point on the, on the presence is that since presence is such a rare commodity, and it's becoming increasingly rare as we are increasingly distracted. If you raise your level of presence, even by an increment, it'll make a big difference. So that's one on which you'll see immediate results. Next question here in the front. Thank you. I wish I'd read your book. I did read yours. It's brilliant. And I wonder if I could ask a question. How many people have read her book? You want to go get it because it's going to be gone tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the thought that I had as I was reading it was, these are all the things that we all know inside. We see it, we hear it, but you were able to put it into such great dialogue, basically. I like you already. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be famous. I really do believe that. I actually approached Elizabeth Warren at the parade and told her she should be consulting with you because both she and Scott Brown came across not charismatic in their <laughs> debates. Has she got in touch with you? Her mistake. Do you have any kind of an NLP background? I don't. Um, NLP is often brought up on this topic, and I've seen people um, use it, and they say that they feel a lot more confident when they use it, and it's, it's one of those things where all I can say is it seems to work great in practice. I learned a lot of what you wrote in NLP classes. Uh, I'm so sorry. Neuro-linguistic programming. Yeah, it depends, who, depending on who you're talking to, it's either natural language processing or <laughs> neuro-linguistic programming. Um, NLP in the neuro-linguistic programming, the Bandler and Grinder work, yeah. right? Grinder work. Um, I've heard great things about it. It's not something I've incorporated. Most of my stuff is based on the wonderful work that Sandy and people in his field have done. So if you like the book, this is the man to thank. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm not a fan of neuro-linguistic programming. And if you remember at the very beginning, I said that um, our language capabilities came after our signaling capabilities in terms of evolution. And language is built on top of the signaling. And so 
it, you know, there's no real science about this, but what seems to be the case to me is they're having the tail wagging the dog. Yeah, language follows signaling, and so if you modify your language, you will modify your signaling some. But the real thing to go is go to the signaling. <laughs> and the way you can do that is by being conscious of it, but by also by this notion of putting yourself in that social role through this method action. And that's usually the small seven words that you can keep on the side. Okay. Next question over here. I was curious on the difference between empathy, compassion, and warmth. Because I, I know I'm sorry, a lot could of, you speak louder? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm really curious on the difference between empathy, compassion, and warmth. Because I've noticed that a lot of leaders have charisma, but they don't have much compassion. So what would be the difference of what you're conveying in warmth and compassion and empathy? You asked what is the difference between compassion and warmth? And empathy, like if I was going for a leadership role and I'm a very compassionate person but I'm not considered a very warm person, what would be the, the difference that you're in the role when you're doing method acting or something like that? That you, know, you don't want to be compassionate, you just want to be warmth? What's the difference? Um, you know, these are all English language terms, so it's, it, you know, they're a little slippery from that. But my understanding, and please correct me, because uh, is that you know, warmth is sort of the total package. It really says, you know, is this person you know, caring, right? Uh, compassion is part of that. Empathy is part of that. Um, attention, paying attention to people is part of it. Um, but I, I interpret the word warmth to mean sort of the whole package. Uh, and, and these other things are elements of that package. Um, <clears throat> one of the pieces of research which I found most uh, fascinating in, in the study of charisma was the role of self-compassion in charisma, which led me to, um, to look at Chris Neff's work at the uh, UT Austin, Texas on self-compassion. It was just fascinating. So let's distinguish between self-confidence which is your belief in your ability to do something or your belief in your ability to learn how to do it well. Self-esteem, which is how much you like yourself. And self-compassion, which is how you treat yourself when you think you failed or when something is not going well. And those three are very different. So for example, self-confidence, self-esteem were positively correlated with narcissism, whereas self-compassion was not. And um, Self-compassion was one of the traits that they measured in, I think in 2009, they measured it on 3,000 people around the world, and it um, was able to, quote unquote, predict levels of resilience, um, ways that they handled setbacks, whether it was ad adaptive or, or maladaptive, um, how well they handled critical feedback, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if I would agree with Sandy that um, warmth is a whole package of and again, let's distinguish empathy from compassion. They're two different things. But if you're going to be looking at compassion, I would say that self-compassion is one of the most uncomfortable practices you can take on and one of the most effective. And surprisingly, self-compassion can play a big role in power. So for instance, it's, um, it's hard to be really present in a conversation when you're in the grip of self-criticism. So in that respect, learning to have self-compassion and to better handle your inner critic can then lift that burden off your shoulders and then you can be a more confident person. In many, many respects, uh, self-confidence is, uh, sorry, self-compassion is uncomfortable as hell, but extremely effective. There's a, a Buddhist discipline called metta, M-E-T-T-A, which I recommend to anyone wanting to learn charisma and or warmth and or self-compassion. And um, Jack Hornfield, one of the uh, uh, leaders at uh, Spirit Rock recommends anyone starting Meta to do a year of self-Meta before they turn to anyone else. Okay, next question over here. Thank you. Um, you spoke earlier of um, people who develop charisma uh, at a very young age, and I'm curious um, as to whether there are specific experiences or mm -hmm. backgrounds that um, are correlated with that development. Thank you. My best guess, and here I'm going out on a limb, is that, um, actually there have been some studies on this, is that uh, the role models you have in your environment at a very young age play a key role. We're, we're monkeys, right? We, uh, 
monkey see, monkey do. That is how we learn. So mimicry is one of the ways that we learn charisma by watching others who have an effect. It's, of course, one possibility is that they see a successful role model using charisma, they mimic the role model, they see the effect, they refine, they learn. That would be my best guess at this point. Sandy, what would you think? Uh, it's got to be something like that. There's probably natural variations. Some people are probably um, better at reading the fine variations in timing or the small movements and are just naturally uh, more tuned into the signals. And some people are also a little more physically adept, so they're able to control their bodies, their presence, their, their response to those things, just like an athlete would. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a little bit of variation there, but I don't think that it's a big variation. Uh, I don't think that it's not, as you said, it's something you can learn. It's like driving. Now, there are good drivers and bad drivers, but everybody can drive. Right? I actually often give my clients the, um, and, and people in general, the analogy of driving a car, and I say, listen, not everyone's gonna become a Formula One race car driver. I'm a terrible driver, but I have learned to get myself from point A to point B, in most cases. In the same vein, not everyone's gonna become Bill Clinton, but most people can learn enough charisma to see a measurable difference in their daily lives. Next question here. Thank you so much, both of you, for speaking this evening. Um, I'm wondering if there's any cultural difference, especially seeing um, that body language plays such a role um, in charisma because body language does vary and give different messages across across cultures. So I was just wondering if certain things don't come across as well when you're in an intercultural situation. Um, my experience, and I, it's not like there's conclusive data about this, is that there's a substrate that has to do with, for instance, arousal, having your f flight or flight sort of tuned in, being excited that way, mimicry, things like that that are really universal, that they're physiological. But that right above that, there's a cultural level. And, um, you know, for instance, when I work with people, uh, senior people in Korea, um, you can tell when, when you've sort of made a point because they freeze, they freeze up. They look uninterested, they look um, distant. Uh, and that's a response. It's like the poker players that overcompensated. Uh, similarly, you know, dominance looks different in different parts of the world. In some places, it's the person that doesn't speak that's the, the leader. And you can tell that, though, by, by the, the little glances people do and stuff like that. But, but they don't dominate the way we would in, in this culture. But the base signaling seems to be the same everywhere. At least that's my... Next question over here. Does charisma ever backfire? <laughs> <clears throat> so I don't know where Sandy's going to take the question. Um, I'm not going to get into the risks of charisma to the outside world because they've been studied ad nauseum. Uh, what was really interesting to me was seeing the cost of charisma to the charismatic person. What are the side effects of being charismatic? And it turns out there really are quite a few. So I'll... I'll um, how do you say in English? I'll riff off a few. Mm -hmm. So one is when people see you as sort of a superstar, they put you on a pedestal. And eventually you'll get to the feeling that you don't really have peers because people see you as special and different. It can get pretty lonely to feel that you don't have peers. Two, with certain forms of charisma, because it turns out there are different forms of charisma and they affect people in different ways. With certain forms of charisma, people stop thinking. It inhibits critical feedback, which is a problem when you're trying to get people brainstorming. Three, the, what I call the Superman effect. Um, people see you as superhuman, and so the people around you can sometimes become overconfident because you know what, you're Superman, you'll fix it. Or they can become lazy because you're Superman, you'll fix it. Here's where it gets really interesting. Of course, like with any other Messiah, when you fail, you can get crucified. The most interesting for me was that certain forms of charisma, if you turn them on too high or for too long, you create kind of a bubble of magic within which people will spill their hearts, their soul, their guts to you. And in the moment, it feels great. And then they exit the magical sphere and their ego slams in and goes, oh God, what have you done? It's kind of a morning after feeling. And then they recoil in shame and guess who gets punished? 
Um, the last point, and this one is still so tentative that I'll barely even mention it, there is possibly, there is possibly a somewhat of a correlation uh, between charisma and um, the highs and lows of uh, mania. And charisma <laughs> is really quite a high. And a lot of charismatics may be possibly turning it on because they're running away from the low that would happen if they weren't charismatic. Oh, one more that I forgot. Um, you it's such a high to have it turned on that you, for, you, you the, the normal life seems dull in comparison. And it's, it's, it, there's a habituation phenomenon and you start expecting the, the high to be on all the time. I got interested in this field. I was um, setting up a, a series of, of laboratories in India. We had a board of directors that was amazing. We had the president of the World Economic Forum. We had the person who was supposed to be the next president of India. We had the richest man in the world, not Bill Gates at that point. Um, and there was way too much charisma. <laughs> I came away feeling like I need a little like meter that like glows red when there's charisma going on because we made the stupidest decisions you can imagine. Somebody would say something with such passion and conviction and everyone else would go, oh yeah. And, and, and it was just bloody stupid. We couldn't work together. Um, and that's something that you were talking about. It's just this notion of it's a bubble. It's independent of feedback. It's not engaging in the group, all right? So um, charismatic behavior has its place, but not if you're working with lots of other people to try and do something as a team. All right? it, can, it can be leadership. Leadership is a type of sort of gentle um, charisma where you can sort of cure ills in the group, right? But, but you have to be careful how you use it because otherwise you, you squash the, the personality of the people and, and of the group. Next question here. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for giving us insightful uh, to hints. Uh, one, one thing I th thought about is that uh, uh, we can practice uh, being charismatic, but uh, it somehow in the beginning it may ca came out as being ungenuine, mm. a fake. Uh, so, so I was wondering whether there's some kind of positive feedback. So maybe in the beginning you feel terrible uh, mm. being a fake, mm. but uh, eventually maybe some success will build upon some initial failures. <laughs> eventually will become, uh, seems more genuine. Well, if you think about this as method acting, you know, in method acting, what you try to do is you really try to be the person. You're not faking it. You're trying to, in some sense, brainwash yourself. It's not act like the person, it's be the person. And if you think about what she was saying about the elements of charisma, it's presence, it's power, it's warmth. So if you try to be a warm, present, you know, positive, powerful type of person, you know, can do, sort of person, that's not bad. If, if you're really genuinely trying to be that way and, and putting your all into it, you're not being fake. You're, you're, you're assuming a social role that may not be your normal. You may be a little uncomfortable with it and people will see that you're a little fragile at it. But you're not being fake. Right? And that's why the, the method acting part, I think, is really, really important. It ties all the little signals together into a personality and a social role, and, and they can see that you're playing, that, that you are filling this role. Not playing, filling the role. Right. Next question over here. You done? Okay. I saw some hands up here. So you said one of the three necessities of charisma is warmth. And um, you also said that you cannot fake warmth. Um, and one of the other examples you used is um, that you cannot possibly be that warm to everybody. Not you, Sydney. Uh, and so I'm wondering, did Bill Clinton and such have trained themselves to use that much warmth constantly to everybody? And also, if you're talking about role models, 
it doesn't seem like anybody in his background was could have been that charismatic considering his family situation. You said people long charisma monkey see monkey do. So, so the question is, is, is it, I didn't catch the last part. You said monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. So who exactly is it that has that background that has that mindset? So what is that? <laughs> what happened to Bill that he grew up that way, right? Um, I, I don't know, actually. I don't know either. I, That's um, no idea. I think he was already established there, right? Uh, I've, I've heard a rumor of a kindergarten teacher had, saying that in kindergarten, uh, Bill was already going around to all the other kids, asking about themselves and being really interested in other people. Some people are, are just, there are outliers in, uh, in various respects of life. That may be one. Sure, he has more predispositions. We're talking starting at Extreme. Sandy, you know this better than I. At what age do babies start knowing the faces and expressions? Oh, very, very young. Very, very young. Yeah, um, ki kindergarten, is, they've already have ye had, had years of training, right? So you say monkey see, monkey do. So people, people try to um, learn from each other. Social learning is probably our dominant mode of learning, copying other people. Um, but Remember that it's partially this social role that you're putting on. You're, you're, you're being a type of person. And you may be in a situation where being that type of person is not allowed. So for instance, if you're in a situation with um, very strict, dominant uh, parents who basically ignore you, um, you're not, you don't have permission to be charismatic as a child. Right? On the other hand, if they're you know, sort of standing back and encouraging you to blossom and lead your own way, then perhaps you do have more permission to do that. So, um, you know, we don't copy everybody around us. We copy the ones that are the people we want to be, the people we feel are like us, the people that we can learn from, right? Um, so it's not uniform everybody all the time. I have a question here. Um, with regards to charisma, um, how does that work for people with autism? Like, for us yeah. in our community, social skills is social skills is something that we continually continually try to learn each and every day, and sometimes we get we get lost in the shuffle w when talking to people. I can I can speak for myself, um, being diagnosed at age four. Sometimes it, it took time for me to learn how to talk, how to interpret uh, people's emotions and feelings. When it, ca when it, came, when it, when it comes to um, being in the social atmosphere, so I was wondering how can, how can w what you said about charisma can apply to us? Well, um, so first thing is nobody really understands those sort of conditions. Um, it, it's interesting, I mean, there's a bunch of things that are interesting, I think. One is, um, you know, there's actually a dormitory at MIT, where at MIT they select the people that join the dorm. There's a dorm where everybody in the dorm <laughs> is autism spectrum, everybody. And their attitude is, it's you guys that don't know how to do things. <laughs> we have our own way of doing it. Um, it's different. You know, uh, but it works. <laughs> you know? um, so I'm not quite sure what to say. There's also different, different uh, sub versions of this. You know, um, I have a student that uh, didn't speak until he was 13. Amazing, right? But he got a PhD. <laughs> he's he's a little odd, but 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 he's he's very genuine about the things he really cares about and passionate. And people care for him and give him slack and recognize his, his power in the areas that he cares about. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's just different, right? It's hard to say, though, because we don't really understand it. 
uh, at any depth. Okay. Last question right here. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the relationship of vulnerability to charisma. I love that one, thank you. Um, have you by any chance watched Brene Brown's video on TED? Okay, I, anyone in the audience, I would encourage you to go to TED.com and type in the uh, search word vulnerability. Brene Brown's TED talk is just lovely. Uh, vulnerability is a power tool, AKA use responsibly. Um, it's <laughs> something that can really create a bond. It's something that's, uh, that's generally gets you very present in the moment. Um, it's something that can also create incredible amounts of warmth and surprisingly gives the impression a fair amount of confidence and power because you have chosen to reveal. Um, but of course you have to choose when, uh, with whom, and how you reveal vulnerability. The other thing that's really interesting is that it seems that it's not actually what you say, it's here again, how you say it. It's not the words you use or the information you, re you reveal, it's the emotional state you're in when you talk about it. And you could be in a moment of vulnerability talking about jelly beans. It really doesn't matter. What matters is that you have chosen in that moment to um, show a piece of yourself that you would usually be hesitant to show. So again, I think it's a fantastic tool for charisma. Um, use responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get your driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was amazing. Thank you guys so very much. Are you okay? Are you guys? I don't know about you all, but I'm going home and I'm going to practice feeling my toes <laughs> and really looking at the colors of everybody I know's <laughs> eyes, beating my chest like a gorilla. <laughs> practicing my deep breathing and self-compassion, because that is hard. And of course, not too much, so I don't have to deal with the downside that you said. <laughs> um, but anyway, just want to thank you guys so much. That was fascinating. And thank you all for coming out. Please stick around. Um